here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We are back. I'm so excited about tonight. I actually told Bethany as I was making uh, the thumbnail for the live version of this thing. If you're listening on podcast form, come on, come on over to the YouTube channel for the live version of this thing. I was actually really excited because we're bringing back underrated, overrated, and this is the first time that we've done it in a minute or two because I've had some like really serious guests on uh, the past few times, you know, whether it be the biologist or Chad or, you know, whoever it may be. And so to just have Bailey back, cause Bailey's here, um, you know, have him back to do underrated overrated. It makes me happy because we're going to have some fun tonight. We've got some semi-serious topics and then we've got some other kind of stupid topics and everybody loves a good underrated <laughs> overrated <laughs> topic, but yeah, that's, that's neither here nor there, but Bailey's here. Bailey, how you doing, buddy? I cannot complain, man. Well, the uh, the high thirties in rain and no lakes to fish right now kind of suck, but uh, we're leaving this weekend to go fish lakes that are actually open. <laughs> yeah, they'll be open, but it'll be just as cold. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. I can at least cast at things that aren't ice. So yeah, dude, I'm I'm very interested. We'll get more into this because one of the topics is the Bassmaster Classic. Because I do want to not only talk about the rating of the Bassmaster Classic, but I also want to talk about the classic itself. But I think it's going to be uh, a very interesting tournament to say the least i think there's a lot of different ways that it plays out and uh i'm interested about that but yeah we'll get into that here in just a minute but for everybody listening on podcast form remember i have a youtube channel you can come over to that youtube channel and i've got like videos shorts i got live streams pants. come on over I got pants i've got sometimes i get naked I mean, that's my only fans. <laughs> but for real, just a reminder, just so it's out there. Because it's so funny. Like, I've been very uh, interested over the past couple of weeks just to, like, interacting with fans and interacting with you guys, the listeners, the, the people who watch. I don't like to call you fans. That freaks me out. But the people who enjoy my channel, I guess those are fans. But the people who enjoy my content that I put out, how interesting it is that it's like, it's like podcast is its own little thing. And YouTube's its own little thing. But then within YouTube, there's like little sub-segments of my audience who enjoy certain kinds of my content and others who don't. I guess don't isn't the right word. I don't even know if YouTube's like showing them the content. Because what's really funny is like I just put out my video about my new kayak that I got. So I got a Jackson yeah. Noir for you guys that didn't watch the video. It's out there. And I, like I had like 20 comments of people being like, man, it's good to see you finally getting into the kayak game. And I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. Um, scroll through those videos, pal. I've, I've been here for a minute, but I do appreciate the con words. You know what I mean? So I don't know. It's just funny. I, it's funny how YouTube serves up content. And I was actually telling Bailey earlier, and if you've not checked it out, and this is going to be funny, and a lot of people are probably going to have the same reaction Bailey did. You got to check out the Pornhub documentary on Netflix. It is wild. It is wild. And it's really wild because like when you first get into it, you're like, man, what is this? But then once you get into it, like they start diving into the whole fact that essentially like Pornhub and other porn websites like that are just giant sex trafficking hubs. And it's kind of takes this really dark, twisted twist. And it's really sad. But the craziest part to me was how Pornhub served up the videos and how really their SEO worked. And like, dude, they have the best SEO, which is search engine optimization for you people that don't know that. That's how YouTube and Amazon and Google helps to serve you what you want to see. It's like how when you click on an ad and then like four days later, it shows you pop tarts or whatever you click. That's how they do that. <laughs> anyway, short, short answer to that. But anyway, like, do they have the, they control all of the SEO for anything that has anything to do with like porn. And dude, I don't know. It was the most fascinating like hour and a half documentary that I've I've watched in a little while. Um, and if you also enjoy that one on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, <laughs> um, there's another one about the oceans and I forgot what it's called, but it's on Netflix too. And you check that one out. But yeah, I've done I, I, I cannot wait to hear the feedback and messages you're going to get of like some dad taking his kid to school of like, Hey, let's listen to Alex's podcast this morning. It's about fishing and first thing <laughs> here's Pornhub SEO. <laughs> I'd like to take this chance to apologize <laughs> to absolutely nobody. And that's oh, why I totally forgot you got the soundboard. That <laughs> scared me after death. Oh, uh, listen, listen, for any dads taking their kids to school about Pornhub documentaries, listen, 
It's educational. May not be educational for them, but it's educational. And that's <laughs> that's again neither here nor there. Now we've got a lot of underrated, overrated topics to get into, and so <laughs> I say we dive into those before old Alex Rudd's ADHD brain takes us down any more holes of talking points that we probably don't need to be talking about. But yeah, documentaries always fun. I always find me a good documentary when I'm at home working on anything, whether it be editing video, getting podcasts ready. I always put me on a. a, a a nice little documentary and usually end up with a new soapbox to get on top of, or some new uh, issue to get behind um, because I do love a good documentary. Yeah. Whatever. Bailey, are you ready? Yes, sir. Take it away. You sure. I think so. Ready as I'll ever be. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's a good way to be. It's a good way to be. The first one's fun. The first one's fun. Uh, the second one, I have a little I have a little rabbit hole. We'll go down on the second. The first one's fun though. I forgot the list. I don't even have I, it up. I have it. I got it pulled up. Don't worry. Underrated. Overrated. Wait, let's stop. For anybody that's never listened to overrated, underrated, what it is is we have a bunch of topics and we give them a rating, either overrated or underrated or adequately rated. And we simply just discuss what we think about these things. These are our opinions and not reflections. What is that thing? It says the the, the opinions uh, discussed in this program are not reflections of any of the sponsors or any da 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 da. Yeah, so there you go. They're just our stupid opinions. And just like opinions, our opinions are like buttholes. Everybody's got one. All right, underrated, overrated. <laughs> you need to make that automated too. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I know. I need to. I need to. Have, I need to have that on the soundboard and just be like, the, the opinions expressed in this program are solely of those of the individuals and not any reflection <laughs> of any sponsor of the Alex Red Fishing Podcast. Thank you for listening and enjoy your day. Underrated, overrated dinosaurs. Dinosaurs God, always underrated, dude. Always underrated. Thank you. Thank you. All right, like. Bailey, did you have an obsession as a kid with dinosaurs like I had an obsession as a kid with dinosaurs? I still do, dude. I never left. <laughs> it's dude, right? The, okay, the new 65 movie, I'm like really wanting to go see that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I may, well, I can't go see it tomorrow, but I may go see it Sunday. Like, I'm really wanting to see it. But, dude, so here's what got me on this little tangent, all right? Is you sent me that TikTok, and if people haven't seen it, there's this TikTok of this alligator and what is that guy doing? What is that guy harvesting? I like, think it, it's some sort of like submerged farm. I, I don't know. I, I'm not going to sit here and act like I know. I, I It's some sort of farm equipment that he's using on like a submerged field down. And it's got to be like a Louisiana type of deal. Cause that's not a Florida deal. No. Yeah. So I, I'm not really sure what it is, but there's this video going around TikTok. It's gone viral. And essentially it's like this, it's this combine looking machine. And as he's combining through this flooded field, there's an alligator laying there and the combine hits him and the alligator just bites it. And the combine picks the gator up and the gator rides it. It's, it's like, like a giant one too. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's like a 13 footer. I mean like huge. And so I said, those are modern day dinosaurs. And then I got to thinking about dinosaurs. And as I go down the rabbit hole with dinosaurs, like I often do, I think about the fact of how absolutely terrifying a dinosaur would actually be. Oh, we'd be screwed. I mean, dude, there would be nothing you could do. I mean, certain dinosaurs, okay, you know, like your little dinosaurs, you know, like your little compies, little green dudes from Jurassic Park. You know, those are little. And a lot of your dinosaurs were small. I mean, there was, you know, uh, almost, I, I read a book actually very recently, The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs in New History. is really good. Actually, it's an audio book. It was really good. But he was talking about how, like, at this point, they think there was hundreds of thousands of species of dinosaurs. You know, and a lot of them were small. But then some of them were, like, I don't think people understand how big they actually were. And like it's absurd. It's absurd. So like you think about like a like a brachiosaurus. Dude, it could just walk through your house and not even it would be like us walking through an anthill. Like yeah. it would just be an it would we would be so insignificant to them that they would just step on us and like kick our cars over and do things like just really a fat and like a Tyrannosaurus Rex, dude. Just think. Like if it really wanted you, what could you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Dig what, a hole. Gun, what gun do you shoot it with? Do Nothing. we have anything? Nothing. Yeah. Like a minigun? The 50 cal minigun? Maybe. But yeah, I don't know. The dinosaurs, to me, I think is one of the most fascinating things. I love dinosaurs. I love the thought of dinosaurs. I love any kind of history to do with dinosaurs. I love museums that have dinosaurs in them. I remember, is it Orlando or what? What? There's an airport that I've been to. Is it Chicago? That has a dinosaur. It's not the actual skeleton, but it's the yeah. Okay, so Sue is in the film museum in Chicago, and Sue's the most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex they've mm -hmm. ever found. 
they have a replica of her in the Chicago airport, if I'm not mistaken. And when I was getting off the plane and going down to pick up my baggage, I got to ride the escalator down and this dinosaur standing there. And it was just like one of the funnest things because I stopped and just like stood there and looked at it for like a good solid 10 minutes. It wasn't even the real thing. And I was just like, this is, this is just so, I mean, they're freaking, their teeth are still one tooth is as big as my hand. Like yeah. it, I love it. I get geeked up about Dude, it. The, the ones that scare me the most are probably either like velociraptors or pterodactyls. Probably more, honestly, more pterodactyls than anything. Yeah. Because you can't go anywhere because they can swim. They can, they can do everything. Yeah. I mean, dude, just imagine. At least the T-Rex, like, they're pretty dumb, at least for what we're told, right? Whereas yeah. like, pterodactyl, like. Yeah. I mean, dude, just imagine. You okay. Replace. Imagine you're sitting on your kayak and t- pterodactyls. <laughs> Oh God! I mean, you're popping off shots at it, trying to get it to go away, and it's just like, ah! you're like "Oh God, don't kill me!" Yeah, we, we're mad because seagulls are eating topwaters. Like, we are their topwater. Oh, dude! I mean, like, dude, how freaking terrible! And some of those things were enormous. You know, you had your little ones, but then imagine some big old, like, I mean, 25, 30 foot wingspan, and I mean, here it comes. Whoo, whoo. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> I mean, you just look at your buddy, you're like, all right, we're done, boys. Yeah, we're dead. This is it. And then think about all the crap that swam around in the lakes back then and in the in their oceans. I mean, like, dude, there was dinosaurs that were as big as whales or bigger in some cases. They swam around in eight other swimming dinosaurs. Like, oh, dude, it gets Different me world up. back then, man. So two things about dinosaurs before we move on. The first thing is... In that book, The Rise and Fall of Dinosaurs, one thing that they're starting to find out is is one issue that a lot of people have with dinosaurs for years and years and years is how did a dinosaur get enough oxygen to survive? Like, how did they even function? Because it was one of the big things that they couldn't, they could never figure out for years and years and years. Well, what they've talked about in this book is the fact that big dinosaurs, when they breathed, could actually store oxygen in their bones because most of their bones were hollow or had hollow chambers within them, which actually helped with rigidity of the bones and made it where they could actually walk around, but then also was a a functional tool for them to be able to store extra oxygen when they breathed in for them to actually be able to operate their body and not literally have a brain aneurysm because of lack of oxygen. So, cool thing. Check out Dude, this comment from Diggs Outdoors. Okay. The good part is you'd be able to get anti-aircraft artillery in the sporting goods store for pterodactyl <laughs> season. <laughs> That's Dude, incredible. I mean, I would love to have just a, like a 50 cow mounted on the back of the, the express. <laughs> Here comes the pterodactyls. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just start hammering them. There's pterodactyl pieces laying everywhere. Yeah, it's like duck seeds. Like, get them, boys. Everyone's got their own 50 cal. (laughs) I love it. it. All right. Second thing about dinosaurs. I don't know if anybody saw this, but it's an article I read the other day. There is a company, and I cannot remember what they're called now. It's called like the Infinity Project or something. I'm not really sure. Um, But they have bought a bunch of land in Siberia, and they have successfully cloned a woolly mammoth or oh, successfully, successfully been able to replicate a woolly mammoth DNA strand to the point where they can now, you know, artificially inseminate an elephant to get a woolly mammoth. They want to bring back a woolly mammoth. They want to bring back the dodo bird, the Tasmanian tiger. And then the fourth one that they want to bring back is a saber tooth tiger. Hell no. I was okay until saber tooth tiger. And then it got a little too Jurassic parky for me because I mean, I think the last thing that we need is a 900 pound tiger with literal swords for teeth that is made to do one thing. And that's kill other giant megafauna type animals like woolly mammoths. It's almost as bad as I'm trying to like reintroduce uh, jaguars to Texas. Well, yeah, but those live there. That's a natural, that's a naturally occurring species that they're just going to reintroduce. And like, a saber that tooth was a long time ago. That wasn't like, that wasn't recent. Jaguars? I don't think they live in Texas. I mean, I might oh, be just. Yeah, yeah no, it, jaguars so. were extirpa- extirpated. That's the word, extirpated? Yes. From Texas in like, dude, 1800s, early 1900s. Like, they just kind of killed them all off down there. Yeah. No, jaguars are from Texas because they come up through the southern border. Hmm. Yeah. I'm just curious like the cattle 
deal. Like that's one more thing for the home of the landowner to deal with. I mean, listen. Can you imagine was... walking outside and your dog just gets taken out by a jaguar? It happens all the time with mountain lions, bro. I mean, think about people who live in mountain lion country. Mountain lions are just grizzly bears. Think about a grizzly bear. Grizzly bear does whatever the hell a grizzly bear wants to do. He wants to walk in your house. Guess what a grizzly bear does? He walks in your house. <laughs> He's like, At least like a grizzly bear, for the most part, you can see that thing. From I feel like a jaguar. You ain't. It's like a mountain lion. You don't know when it's there. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. Yeah, now jaguar. Dude, it's like the scariest part. When I was talking to this guy from fishing game up here in New York because we have them here. Not a lot, but we have them. And he's like, chances are, uh, he's like, he's talking to a room. He's like, chances are all of you have been in the presence of a mountain lion and never known it. I'm sitting there, I'm like, that's sketchy. I believe it. I So I was watching Meat Eater. They were, um, it was one of their YouTube series, and um, uh, Giannis Patelis was trying to tag a mountain lion, and they got within like 25 yards of it and never saw it. Like they didn't know, like they knew it was there because it was tagged and they were going on the radio call, but they never could see the mountain lion. They never heard it. They just know that it started moving away. Mm. Yeah, that's, it's terrifying. Like you want to know something else? Little rap <laughs> I just, I just had a really, just, I saw a comment here that just started, it's, it's messed up, but I started yeah. laughing. Yeah. Army Outdoors said about eagles taking small puppies. Have you ever have you ever seen like the tags that you could put to find your dog? Like you put on their collar, yes, so yes. you can always see where they're at. You just see it on the app, just going across the county. Yeah, just just, just the, why is he flying thirty miles an hour? Oh God, Fluffy, he's gone. <laughs> I mean, hey, listen, I my dad's dog. Well, my I mean, technically, it was my dog when I still live with mom and dad. He there was a hawk almost took him out one day. Like it, he was walking in the yard, and like the hawk was like, "I'm gonna eat him." And like jump down and was like go to square up with him and try to kill him, like yeah, it's ridiculous. So I was gonna say, so, oh, I got I got another little something we can go down here. Black <laughs> panthers, you know that the black panther is not a real animal. What do you mean, like the they're real? They're not a they they are not scientifically by a scientific basis. There is no thing as a black panther. Is there a black jaguar? There's a palmated jaguar, which is where their skin tone and all their hair color gets messed up and they become all black with just darker black splotches. But there are no black panthers. Like my high school mascot, we were the pal black panthers. There's all kinds of stories. Like my grandpa and you know my papa and all these people, all these older folks around here will tell you about black panthers and seeing black panthers, but there is no such animal as a black panther. Cy Robertson, the old famous black panther story from Duck Dynasty. It's not real. Black Panthers aren't. So you're telling me like that. What, what is the Jungle Book with the? Yeah, no, is it's it not a real. Black Panther? It's not. Yeah, yeah. He's he's ruined my childhood. Yeah, I know, dude. But like, I'm. But what I'm saying, like, what I'm kind of getting at, which will lead to our last topic for tonight, is there are things out there that people for generations upon generations upon generations have talked about these things existing, but we have never scientifically proved that they exist. But, I mean, do they exist? Who knows? All right. Underrated. <sighs> Overrated. I love the addition of the, the, the prop knife. knife. Yeah. Hey, listen, I had a guy send this to me, and it's actually a really nice little knife. I uh, appreciate it. Ada Outdoors. It's about the only thing you're getting from me. Um, <laughs> that was terrible. Um, it is a nice knife, though. All right. Underrated. Overrated. The coal shad. Now I have a whole rabbit hole. We're going to go down here, but just what do you think so far? Uh, I think it's underrated. Okay. Why do you think it's underrated? Now that you've had your hands on it for a moment, why do you think it's underrated? Uh, I think it's underrated in the fact that you don't need one particular real speed to be able to actually get it to swim correctly. Or if like you get a little bit over or under that, it's not going to work correctly. Like a mag draft. Mm -hmm. This is coming exactly from from somebody that loves throwing a mag draft. I own a crap ton of them. Mm -hmm. um, like I literally have two giant boxes full of them. Um, I like the fact that you can do more with the cull shad that you can't do with the mag draft. Mm -hmm. In regards to one, it lasts the cull shad lasts more than two fish. Uh, the the clip, like the clamp that it goes to attach the treble hook. And attaches by the shank, so you don't have to tuck one of your 
treble hooks in the in the bait. Uh-huh. And that is extremely hard to rip out of the plastic. Uh-huh. Whereas the magnet system in the mag draft, it to fish and it's already like either fallen out or yeah. it's like completely just not aligned anymore. And the bait isn't swimming as true. Uh-huh. Um, but also just like that honeycomb pattern, that honeycomb technology is pretty legit in regards to the fact that the tail will kick much higher up into the body of the bait. Like you had a great picture. I don't know if you ever posted it, but you had a great so, demonstration of what we're trying to talk what that honeycomb pattern really does. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it doesn't sacrifice the durability of the bait too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, let me find this picture. It's on here somewhere. I know I, uh, I I'm just not, I, I, I can see like from the, when it's your naked eye, obviously it's a, it's a paddle tail swim bait with a treble hook, but like, yeah, you yep. got call shad on the left, mag draft on the right. That is a significant difference in the softness of the tail to be able to kick that much wider. Yep. It's yep. really impressive. Um, yep. I hate the knockoff terminology. There's there's knockoffs. I love that Andrew Andrew's in here. Tackle Talk podcast. And uh Andrew and I have been talking about this since the call shad dropped. He goes, he goes, calling a knockoff is dumb rant coming in three, two, one from yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coming, ladies and gentlemen. Don't worry. There's knockoffs and there's improvements. hmm mm-hmm. Two different things. Mm-hmm. 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 Take it away. Yeah. So um from somebody who actually has the bait and has gone and thrown it and actually hooked a fish on it, it is very different than a mag draft in the action that it has. Um, and Bailey's right about the fact that I don't have to find a real speed to reel it at. It can perform at a lot of different reel speeds. Um, I also played around with putting in some some different weights into it, you know, little Nico uh, weights. And it was amazing to me how just a little bit of weight would change the fall rate of that bait as well as the performance at certain reel speeds again. And so yeah. in that fact, I'm really impressed with it because there's two designated nail weight slots that you yeah, put which in. Is, it's not like shoving it up in a mag draft wherever you feel like. Yeah. Which is really, really cool. And I mean, this is coming from a guy who had a ton of success with a mag draft. I mean, I was throwing a mag draft before throwing a mag draft was cool. I think I caught my first fish on a mag draft in like 2016. I mean, it was as soon as they were released. I had an eight inch mag draft and I went to Cherokee Lake and caught some giant fish on it. And I mean, that's what kind of started my journey down the whole, you know, swim bait deal was that swim bait. The mag draft is what got me going on it. And so, you know, really looking at the bait itself, it is, it is, yes, categorically, it's the same as a mag draft. It's a Mm -hmm. harnessed swim bait. Um, And one thing that really kind of frustrates me about some people is how, you know, they want to attack any one particular company is this is a mag draft knockoff. All right. Jackal makes a harness swim bait. That's exclusive in Japan. Um, Amakatsu makes a harness swim bait. That's exclusive in Japan. Um, there are several other, ja- I think ISSE who makes the Gilly also, or not the Gilly, but wherever the Gilly thing is also has a harness swim bait. Um, you know, and you look at these companies and they make these products that are essentially mag drafts. It's, we just don't know about them. And so, People don't care here. Now, underrated, overrated. I'm going it's underrated right now. I think that um, here, here's kind of my thought process on the underrated thing. And this is kind of when I go back to the slobber, slobber knocker. It's not and or, it's both and. You know what I mean? That's kind of my theory on, mm-hmm. you know, mag draft and call shad. I think having both in your box is a very smart idea because I can promise you there's going to be some day – for whatever freaking weird reason that they're going to eat a, eat a six inch mag draft over a cold shot. You know that yeah. there's days yeah. that we eat a slobber knocker better than they do a jackhammer. I'm still going to buy them. And I'm, I'm, Hey dude, me too. I mean, there's still stuff that I buy and that's what's so funny is like a lot of people want to pin me as just like, well, he gets paid by Berkeley. And so he's just going to, you know, uh, do whatever, you know, bend over for him. No. And that's not how this works with me. I still use other brand things. Like I still love uh FC sniper fluorocarbon like for liters, 10 pound, six pound. Liter. Like if I'm going like a six or an eight pound liter, I mean, FC sniper fluorocarbon is some of the best in, in the world for that. Not, not that I'm degrading trialing. Trialing is just as good. But if I go anything below 10, I'm going to go to something a little bit different. Go did ahead. you watch, did you watch Ty's video? On- yeah. With the Spro. That was weird. Wasn't it? Uh, dude. 
Spro needs to pay that man because I ordered Spro line immediately. Yeah, yeah, that was immediately. Cool. <laughs> that was a. I don't know the last YouTube video that I watched from the first second to the very last. Yeah, that one. Like, I, like but I yeah. mean, to be fair, he put like an ungodly amount of hours into yeah. that. So yeah, it's impressive. Now, to get into my rant about copycat knockoff culture and knock off anything. I'm going to say exactly here what I said on Mr. Tackle Talk podcast's post about the coal shed. I see nobody in an uproar out in front of Walmart about the great value brand line of products. I don't see anybody in an uproar about Amazon and everything that's an Amazon basic product. And Berkeley, just like Amazon basics, usually takes a product, they make a better version of it, and they sell it at a more affordable price for the normal person to be able to buy. That's my thought process on that. Like, it's stupid because really when you look at fishing, you look at fishing baits and you look at what is going on, everything comes from something else. And when I had dream catchers on, we talked about this. You got to look, if you look at John Mayer, then you got to naturally look at Stevie Ray Vaughan. And if you look at Stevie Ray Vaughan, you naturally have to look at Jimi Hendrix. And if you look at Jimi Hendrix, you naturally have to look at B.B. King. And if you look at B.B. King, you naturally have to look at the artists that came before him. It's just like the Beatles or anything. I mean, you look at a modern day rock band like the Foo Fighters. If you're going to look at the Foo Fighters. Well, then you got to look at, you know, all these bands that preceded them that were influences on the way that they did things. Mm -hmm. I believe that the fishing industry is the same exact way. I mean, these, yeah, it may be a copycat or a copy or whatever, but if they're taking this thing and they're making it their own and they're adjusting it to the things that they see fit to be adjustments to it, I mean, I, I think that that's where the industry is going and that's just the natural progression of things. I mean, because I've said it before and we've said it with you. I mean, dude, like, where do we go from here? Lunker hunt? I mean, because like they're the only people really doing like cool, innovative stuff. If you really look at it, I mean, nobody out of Japan is doing really thing anything cool or innovative. Jackal has a direct to head connect bladed jig. ISSE has a direct to head connected connected bladed jig. Um, like Mega Bass, I'm sure has a direct to head connect bladed jig. I mean, they are a Z man chatterbait. It's just the only reason that they don't get in trouble over there is because the patents don't apply in Japan. Well, it's it, funny too that like. Z-Man wasn't even the first bladed jig, but people forget that. Yeah. It was Phoenix. Yeah. So, it, it, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, I see nothing wrong with if I'm a, a brand and another brand comes out with a bait. Now, there's one thing if they have a patent on a specific nature or style of the bait, but I see nothing wrong with, hey, this bait doesn't allow me to do this. I think I can make something that allows it to do that to offer a consumer something different. And I mm -hmm. go and make that. Mm -hmm. I don't see a problem because as a consumer, you're offering something completely different. I look at that as an angler. I'm like, I want to be able to, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll lay it all out there in regards to being transparent with people. Mm -hmm. I throw slobber knockers. I throw jackhammers. Mm -hmm. The slobber knocker does not hunt. The jackhammer hunts. Mm -hmm. there's two different applications. Whereas slobber knocker is amazing around wood mm -hmm. jackhammer. Not so much mm -hmm. like, so there's, there's different applications for it. Whereas then people go out and they just say, you know, this is a knockoff. This is a copycat or look, it might be similar, but they have different applications and they, they have specialties in different parts of fishing where it's just, people are so quick to say, Oh, it looks like that bait. It's a knockoff. Mm -hmm. I, I just, at least if you're going to call it a knockoff, do a little bit of research before you just start. I mean, I guess that is so social media these, these days, but mm -hmm. well, um, and I mean, here's the deal is there's some people over in the comments saying that I'm not looking hard enough. You're missing the point of what I'm saying. It's like yeah. the Gilly. No one had ever heard of ISSE until the Gilly came out. And then everybody wanted to say that the Gilly was a knockoff of that bait. Berkeley brought a bait to America, made it more readily available to the normal consumer and made it at an affordable price. When you're saying these small little one-off Japanese brands that no one's ever heard of that you're paying $35, $40, dollars in custom fees and importing fees and all these things to get them to America. Yeah, I get that. Okay, if that's the little weird 
niche inside of a niche inside of a niche inside of a niche market that you want to get into and you want to buy stuff, then cool. I, that is awesome because there's people who collect things. I mean, that's more of almost a collector's culture than it is an angling culture. I'm worried about catching fish and keeping it affordable for you guys. That's my main focus. Like that's why I don't use six hundred dollar reels and rods and throw twelve hundred dollar combos and buy fifty and sixty and seventy dollar baits, is because I just I look at fishing as more utilitarian than I think a lot of people do. And like, so for these people who are into the like the collecting culture of JDM super super specific baits, that's cool. And I can promise you, if I ever go to Japan, I'm gonna come back with a suitcase full of crap. I can promise you that. <laughs> but like, there's just nothing, I think, under the sun within the 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 fishing culture that is that innovative. And so like, you know, and there's a whole other aspect of this of like, when you really look at how many freaking crawl baits are there? How many worms are there? How many crank baits are there? I mean, like a, a small body, medium diving crankbait. Every single company makes one. Mm -hmm. but when the Spro Rock Crawler came out, no one caught it a knockoff of the Bandit. And mm -hmm. when the Bandit came out, nobody caught it a knockoff of a Norman. And when the Norman came out, no one caught it a knockoff of the original like wood balsa hand carved baits that everybody was making around here. Mm -hmm. And I've got baits. There's a. I mean, hold on. Let me grab this. This is a perfect example of this. Hold on, just one second. Hey, this yeah. is it's a there's a long chain you could take this so many different directions from from craw baits to the the, the freaking senko like you could, you could right, for everybody that. listening on on uh podcast form i've now pulled out a shadow box that my dad made me of all of my old great grandpa's lures i don't see anybody crying and it, does anybody know the names of any of these anybody know the names of any of these you're trying to ask the conversation i'm just asking anybody like I think I'm the only one that could they could speak here. Yeah. Well, I mean <laughs> someone's I, gonna raise their hand in the I mean, they can comment, but I mean like I don't this see is your anybody, teacher showing. Yeah, I don't see anybody <laughs> outraged. I mean, that's a jitterbug. I do know that. Um, I don't see anybody outraged and in the streets that are complaining about this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's kind of where I'm at with this. Is it's like I, I have to see if there's gonna be outrage with one thing, then we gotta be outraged about everything. Like if you're yes. gonna be mad about the Berkeley Cole Shad, then you gotta be pissed about Dr. K instead of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> like if you're gonna be mad about like the Cole Shad, well then you gotta be really pissed at every other car brand that ever made a vehicle after Henry Ford. Or any other shoe brand after the first shoe. Exactly. Like, <laughs> I mean, seriously. And it's just is what it is. I mean, like, I think it's just I think that's more my thing is it's like there's people there's kids dying of cancer and people are arguing on the internet about a bait that Berkeley made. Like I <laughs> just like that's like I just get so But since the flatworm came out, there's been two other companies that literally have the same exact shape of a flatworm and try to call some so, sort of knockoff scent yeah. on it, but no one's no one's gonna talk about that either. No. Yeah. So is what it is. Is what it is. That's kind of my thought process on this. There's a lot of people, their panties are just in a giant wad about something that I just don't think is that big of a deal. It's just like, <sighs> yeah, hey, I love this. I'm not a big Berkeley fanboy, but I think they get the Nickelback treatment. Yeah. Mm. That's, yeah. Everybody, there's two types of people in the world. There's people who like Nickelback and there's people who say they don't like Nickelback and they actually do like Nickelback. All right. So let's keep on going. Underrated. Overrated. Bassmaster Classic. Uh, I'm going to say that one's adequate, adequately rated. They call it the Super Bowl of bass fishing. I think it, it's it's looked at as the Super Bowl of bass fishing. Okay, well, explain that more to me. I'm not understanding, like, just explain I, like, what you mean. When I, I think about the Classic, uh, I don't think it's – blown out of proportion i think it's put on a pretty badass stage i think they do a great job bass itself at marketing the event so do the anglers themselves uh the the classic you know for especially who wins it uh it'll change your entire career for that person who wins it mm -hmm. um but i don't think it's underrated because i don't think because just about everybody especially in the sport of bass fishing itself 
knows what the classic is. They know it's a championship event. They know it's the biggest, uh, you know, fishing tournament in bass fishing specifically. I'm not going to say fishing in general Uh because there's tournaments much bigger than it in fishing, but Uh in bass fishing specifically, everyone looks at it as like the epitome of like, if you have any lick of competitive drive, you want to bass fish at the classic. You want to be in the classic. Chances are, if you're a tournament bass fisherman, the one thing you grew up as a kid was walking across the classic stage or at least attending a Bassmaster classic. I think, but I also, I just don't think that like, it's something that they go out and, you know, overblow as this gigantic, huge thing that it's not, they don't, I think they do a great job, but I think it's it's adequately rated as this badass platform for tournament bass fishing. Uh, they do a great job of promoting it, and it's great for the fans, great for the anglers, and the organization. Like I, I don't know a world without a, a classic. If that makes sense. I like it. I like that explanation. It's a good explanation. Okay. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm going to go adequately rated as well. Um, I've been to quite a few Bassmaster Classics. They are fun. Uh, I've always found it interesting that if they didn't have the free component of the whole thing, if there would be any draw whatsoever. What What do you think? Like if they didn't have the free show, the free expo, if they didn't have the free way in, like if you had to somehow, let's say that we tried to charge even a $5 admission to see the way in, in order to up the payouts for the anglers at the end or up the pay, you know, $5 admission fee, like kind of like a UFC fight. I wouldn't say a UFC fight's a bad comparison because I mean, it's a pay-per-view event, but you know, that like that's part of how the fighters get paid is pay-per-view points. So the more they build up the fight, the more they build up the event, the more, you know, like people they get to come into it, like the more the more money they make on the back end. I just wonder if you made that a a purchasable uh, product, we will say, do you think that as many people would show up like the Super Bowl? Like Because we like to compare it to the Super Bowl, but people have to buy tickets to the Super Bowl. Right. I think people still pay, at least for weigh-in, they'd pay five bucks. I could be wrong. I mean, I'm sure some people would be deterred, but I, th- I still think like 75% of people that say, Hey, I want to go watch the way in the classic and you go to the door and it's $5. I still think they're going to pay $5 expo. I don't think someone's going to pay $5 to go walk around the expo. So you, you believe if they've turned it into a ticketed event, I think, well, they. I think a lot of people like, go still. Let's say it's like an actual ticketed event, like where it's like, I mean, let's say UT football game. Where the closer to the stage you get, the more it costs. You know, I mean, like, there's all these. No, 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 I don't think it would sell at all. Yeah, I don't know. It's just an interesting. I just think if you did, if you, it's a first come first serve five dollars for everybody. I think you, you, it'd be. I don't think many people would flinch. I think again, I still think there'd be some people that would, but uh, I think the vast majority, like say a seventy five percent, that people are, that are going to go to the watch weigh in mm-hmm. would still pay five dollars. But if you're gonna say, hey. Cause like it's, it's an arena that's like every seat as it is, is already kind of far from the stage. Mm-hmm. There's like the small section in the middle you can get to, but that's honestly majority media mm-hmm. that get that sit there. Mm-hmm. Um, there are some VIP stuff, but I had, it, it would be hard for me to even label a, the higher up you go, the more yeah. like, I, I, I don't, yeah I don't think you could do that. I guess it's pending the venue, but I don't know. I just but, I mean it's here's just, a good comment though. Uh Hayes is in the chat says people pay twenty dollars for the Columbus, Ohio Expo. Oh well, I mean, yeah. I there mean that's perspective for you. I, yeah, that is perspective. I mean, because people pay to get into the fishing expo around here. I don't really get that, you know, but I think that that's like the biggest draw of the classic is that everything is free. This comment from Army Outdoors, uh the the bass life pass. Like if you had a membership, maybe what if you got in for free? Ooh. That could be like incentive for like, especially a- anglers. You know what I mean? We better shut up because they'll probably steal this format from us and turn it into some paid subscription service. <laughs> Never have a free classic ever again. <laughs> Never have a free classic ever again. But um, I'm sure it's been discussed. I'm sure they've talked about it. Yeah, I'm sure they have, and that's probably what that's what interests me the most about it is because you know I had Chad on last week who was part of visit Knoxville, and just like the biggest selling point was. Hey, it's all free. Did we mention it's free? 
hey, it's all free. And like mm-hmm. that was just like the biggest drawing point. And it got me to thinking just kind of a thought experiment more than anything. Like if we made this a ticketed event, you know, I mean, like this next UFC fights that, that's coming up, me and Bethany were looking at tickets. Um, it's in New York, New Jersey. And I mean, like, you know, tickets are four or five, six hundred bucks a piece for not even that good a seat. So like, and if you want good seats, you know, you're talking two, three, four thousand dollars. And now, you know, obviously that's UFC. It's not bass fishing. It's a much bigger um, sport, we'll say, than than bass fishing will ever be. But I just find it interesting if if you were to put a dollar amount on that, like wonder wonder if that draw would still be there. You know what I mean? Um, but going back to the underrated, overrated thing, I think it's adequately rated. I think that the best part of the classic for me is the expo. Um, I think that that's a really cool. I think that I think that's what makes it almost underrated is the fact that Bassmaster has figured out a way to be able to bring such a cool show for anglers to a city like Knoxville for completely free. And, you know, they're going to have a party Thursday night with a drone show. They're going to have this giant expo where you can go buy stuff and, you know, do all this stuff. And why'd you look at me like that? (laughs) Well, I guess people got the sneak peek. (laughs) Oh, Chad talked about it last week. Um, Anyway, (laughs) I think it's on a billboard going downtown too. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're promoting it. Yeah. And yeah, Um, Hummingbird put it out the other day that they were. Yeah, they, they didn't specify what it was. Oh, that's a drone show. That's what Chad said. <laughs> Chad said that before I did. Um, I, got, I got yelled at today for putting drone show on an artwork. I had to take it off. Well, Chad Culver on the Alex Road Fishing Podcast has already said it, and there's already been about, well, 1,100 people have listened to the audio forum, and there's another about 1,200 people watch the video. So there you go. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but like, I think that that is, I think that that is what is, makes it almost underrated in my opinion. Now the whole The classic itself, I think it's just adequately rated. To me, it's, I mean, yes, it's the Super Bowl of bass fishing. Yes, you had to qualify for it. Yes, this is the the pinnacle of, you know, when everybody thinks about winning a tournament, you want to win the classic. But to me, you know, it's still, I mean, it's just a fishing tournament to me still, kind of, you know what I mean? I think think the whole buildup around it, the whole, the videos, the, the cool stuff, the production value, the expo, the, I mean, the lots, the sound, all that, that's what makes it cool. Mm-hmm. And of course, it's still just a fishing tournament, but you got to have that awesome buildup around it. And it's kind of like a UFC fight. The UFC fight is only as cool as the buildup to the UFC fight. You know what I mean? Like you got to be in the hop for it to be hop. So yeah, I'm going, I'm going adequately rated to almost underrated. All right. Thanks. Excellent. There is a, a hot a comment in here uh, from Wrong Omer. I don't even know how to pronounce yeah, that. Wrong. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. His hot take: Kayak Classic will have more number than the Boat Classic. I'm curious what he means by numbers. Maybe more participants. Well, participants yeah. for sure, because there's a cap for yeah. the Boat Classic. I don't think there's a cap for the Kayak Classic. I wonder. I wonder how many people will show up and watch the kayak portion of the weigh-in. The families of the anglers that are going on stage. Oh, come on now. Oh, more pounds. Well, it's in inches. Oh, oh pounds? Chickamauga. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go that somebody's probably going to catch a 10-pounder on Chickamauga. If you're going in total? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, uh, yes. there. I can promise you, Chickamauga in March, somebody will swing and swing into something huge. Mm-hmm. It's just the way that it is. You at, at any With that many people on chickamauga fishing at that high of a level somebody will swing into a giant there's no doubt in my mind it's just yeah. who does it and how many times does this happen because that's the thing about march fishing on chickamauga is who's going to do it and how many times can it happen within a three-day span top three are going to mess them up good mess them up real good all right underrated overrated pancakes overrated God, you and Bethany, what the hell is wrong with you un-American asshole? Uh, why, why are they overrated? <laughs> I don't know. I've never really been like a pancake guy. What, not, what is it okay, about? Let me, let, me, let me lay this out for yeah. you. Uh, I, unless, this sounds so bad. Unless my fiance makes breakfast, I skip breakfast entirely. I'm not a breakfast guy. I haven't been for a while. I am, um... I enjoy breakfast. Breakfast is probably okay. Let me say this. Like I'm not a person who gets up and like adamantly eats breakfast every morning, but I do enjoy the breakfast meal. 
So mm-hmm. like, if you said, Hey Alex, do you want to have some eggs and bacon and pancakes and hash browns? I would be like, Oh hell yeah, brother. Let's go get it. <laughs> but like, you know, yeah. I mean, but when it comes to a pancake, dude, a pancake is probably the most, one of the most underrated foods in the existence of the world. I mean, there is nothing better than a good, big, fluffy pancake covered in maple syrup. I, I'm a I'm a breakfast sandwich guy if I do choose breakfast. Well, I can make you a wicked breakfast sandwich. I do make a killer breakfast sandwich. I can do that. Deal. I'll cool. see you next week. <laughs> a hard-cooked egg, a little bit of maybe, maybe even – I won't even do the toast. We will bump it up, and we'll go in everything bagel. How about that? That's money. Now you're talking. That's it. That's it. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I love pancakes. I love breakfast. I love breakfast as a meal. Like, I'm a breakfast guy. So, yeah. Uh, I got to go underrated with the pancakes. You, Bethany says waffles. I don't, Bethany said earlier, she's like, I know pancakes are overrated. I like waffles because the waffle, the little squares <laughs> hold syrup. And I'm like, sit over there with your glasses on, you geek, your four eyes. Like, hush. Like, what is that? Like, who says that the damn squares hold the syrup? I, I know she's sitting up there right now. I may get, something thrown at me here and just just gonna gonna say you can be in trouble here soon hey no but biscuits and gravy yeah biscuits and gravy i i I, dude i love breakfast who am i kidding like i love a good breakfast i'm a brunch guy too like i could do some brunch sounds very uh manly of me you want to go to brunch um but yeah but i'm not a coffee guy you like coffee don't you i need yeah i'm I'm a bad one with that i need coffee i need caffeine Yeah, I, I'm a DDC kind of di- – DDC. DC and a DDP kind of guy. Like, I love uh, me some .co. Yeah. Some the, the past few months, though, man, it has been like uh, – the coffee has been bad. Like, it's just because it's been like five hours of sleep. Mm-hmm. Just trying mm-hmm. to make sure I'm getting everything done and mm-hmm. not sacrificing, like, my full-time job stuff. And it's just – You tried free basic cocaine. I can either confirm nor deny it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit of Adderall mixed in there, and you're just like, yeah. it's me 24 7 without the drugs. Yeah. I mean, you know, just imagine having my sort of energy, but without the drugs. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what just it's like. Wake up, shotgun, two Red Bulls, and just go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah. What's bad is when I drink caffeine, it actually stabilizes me just a little bit. So that's how I know I have ADHD. It's because I'll get up in the morning, I've not ate or drank anything, and Bethany will say, Lord have mercy, get yourself a dot, Dr. Pepper, so the caffeine will like chill me out just a little bit. You know what I mean? I listen, everybody's wondering about the drinks. Am I a mimosa guy? Al Kavanaugh. I'm not a mimosa guy. I don't drink, actually. I don't enjoy alcohol. I have in my cup water tonight. Um, the hardest drink that I will drink is a little bit of dot, Dr. Pepper, or maybe even a monster if the mood hits me right. But other than that, I'm not a good frisky. Yeah, if I'm feeling a little frisky, I'll, you know, I'm not a big drinker, never have been. I, I have tried beer, don't like it. Liquor and all those kinds of dark whiskeys, don't like any of that. Just nothing, nothing have I've ever tried. But I have a weird taste palette as well, too. Like, I'm one of those people who doesn't like, um, what's the stuff they put in salsa that everybody, t- it, you, it either tastes good or tastes like soap. Um, sauce? Yeah, they put it in salsa. Oh, salsa. Uh, you know, green stuff. They put it all over Mexican food all the time. What's that stuff? Oh, uh, I have no idea. I know what you're talking about. Um, why can I not think of that word? Um, the stuff. What the heck's the stuff called? The stuff. The dang green stuff. Cilantro. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Cilantro. Cilantro. The stuff. Yeah, so <laughs> cilantro to me tastes like soap. So I think that has something to do with my taste palate of not liking beer or any alcohol or liquor or anything like that. So I don't know. I'm I'm just not a not a big heavy drinker. More just a water guy in my nice lot blue cup. Um, so yeah, I've been trying to drink more water too because it's good for you. All right, underrated, overrated. Any catch product? You mean catch like catch boards, catch carts? Oh, oh, oh. catch. Uh. I don't know. I know they make a cart, but I don't know it enough to give a opinion. I got. But I said the boards. I mean, I'd say adequately rated because they're the only one we're allowed to use. In the kayak. <laughs> it's got to be rated because it's literally it's the only goddamn one. monopoly is what it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was about to. That's why I was going to go highly, highly overrated because they have a monopoly on boards. Like, why has no one else come out? Like, okay, first of all. How did they become the golden standard? Can you kind of give me some insight about what made them like the board to use? I think because 
they were one um there was the hog trough which had issues in regards to being too flexible in regards that you can you could push down on the board and get an, and gain an extra inch or so mm-hmm. with that fish mm-hmm. on a hog trough being that it was plastic mm-hmm. and i think because catch was they weren't you know first to the game but they were early enough mm-hmm. and they had a great product that was accurate they had the flashy different colors that was like caught the angler's eyes they could match their kayaks type of deal mm-hmm. and the fact that it just was heavy duty accurate um you know wasn't gonna break any type of stuff i think the fact of that was just like hey let's force everybody to run these because they needed one board if you tell people one to three different boards that they can use it kind of doesn't exactly make things universal if that makes sense whereas like if you look at major league fishing they all have to have the same scale mm-hmm. probably should if you're going to have thousands of dollars on the line to win you should probably should have it as even of a playing field as possible mm-hmm. even when it comes down to the measuring device uh so it's easier to have a tournament director or tournament team from a crew standpoint be a well versed in one board familiar with one board mm-hmm. to get everybody on on, on par and i think just did, since you say, then, did you say one board yeah, one like one, one board. Mean, that's quite big. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Damn soundboard. Uh, <laughs> I, I think just since then, like they don't want to change. Like there's no, there hasn't been a reason to go somewhere else because catch has always just kind of provided that top notch product, which it, it is. The their their boards are great. And I also just think for anybody outside looking in, it's like they've owned this, and it's not as big enough of a market i think to an outside company to be like hey let's go try to compete with this i don't think it's big enough for them to be like we could gain ground or worth their effort yeah no i agree i agree and that's kind of what i figured but yeah i just find it very it's just kind of interesting like it was like all of a sudden everybody woke up one day was like catch is the best and catch really does i mean they make a fantastic product it's made in america i, I think almost all of the board is cnc aluminum which is really cool because that's kind of something that i am familiar with because that's what my dad does for a living is sell those types of tools and so that's cool to me yeah. and i do have a catch card i actually bought a catch cart and that's what i'm going to be using with my jackson nar and dude the thing is overbuilt and it's badass it's big and it's heavy it's very very heavy and big but gnarly bra gnarly bra <laughs> gonna be out there man just catching some waves bra um <laughs> Well, you're going to catch waves in that one. <laughs> it's right, wave right over the damn bow. Listen, uh, Bailey, I almost lost Bailey as a friend the other day when I told him I bought a Jackson R. I really had to kind of like caress him back into being my friend because he was like, he was done with me. He's like, get rid of your PA 14. You're a loser. I'm done with our friendship. <laughs> uh, Saucier, San Antonio. I hit the wrong one. But anyway, I was going to go with this one. I will downsize your face with a shovel. That's the way Bailey was with me the other day on the phone. He said those exact, that was actually a recording of Bailey, not Will Smith. Yeah. That was Bailey telling me how he did not like my Kusa. That was me on FaceTime. Uh, Nara that I bought. So, yeah. Um, yeah, no, the catch, the catch, catch products are. They are they are adequately rated. Um, I think that one because it is like the only thing that we can use in kayak tournaments anymore. Um, they do make a fantastic product, and I just I just found it very interesting. I think you're right though. It's like there's not enough reason for anybody else to come out with anything else to drive any yeah. sort of competition in that realm. You know what it, I mean? Yeah, because like there's a bunch of boards out there like for just like figuring out if your sea trout is a legal trout to you know to yeah. keep. Like yeah. th- those are out there. There's a bunch of those. It's different if you're talking the general population, but from a tournament standpoint, yeah, I mean, like that's why there's only really only one scale that all these MLF guys are using. Yeah, yeah, it's so. interesting, 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 interesting. All right, underrated, overrated chickens, like live living chickens. <laughs> uh, I, I think I think nowadays, dude. They're uh, underrated. Hell yeah, they are. Listen, my my last chicken got smoked the other day by a hawk, and I'm very sad because I ain't got nothing producing <laughs> eggs anymore. I do have six brand new chickens out in the garage, though. They're getting of age of eggs pro- egg production. But, I mean, listen, when I had three chickens, I was getting anywhere from five to six eggs, like, every two days. 
I mean, I was doing a half dozen eggs pretty much in two days and all the rest of you poor guys out there, you know, paying however much eggs are now. I don't even know how much eggs are, how much uh, are eggs? Absurd. Absurd. I have yeah. to ask the uh, lady. She, yeah, she does all the shrimping. Yeah, I don't keep up with any of that. Bethany just tells me things are more expensive, and so I just try to go make more money. I work harder and harder and harder. Um, chickens are, are, are honestly, they are adequately, they are, I mean, they're overly, overly under, they're extremely underrated animals is what I'm trying to say. Um, they are. The comments on this one are great. I love it. I love it. What is everybody saying? I'm not even M and W fishing says they're a little cocky. <laughs> they're a little cocky. And let me tell you something. You know, I got Bailey a job the other day at a chicken farm because I told him he was really good at handling small cocks. And he started the next day and he denied the job. And I don't understand why. So then I passed it off to Ben Nowak and he wouldn't take it either. I told the guy, I said, listen, man, I'm well versed in large cocks, but not in small cocks. So I can't take the job. I'm very, very sorry. Um, but yeah, so yeah. The uh, chickens, chickens are extremely, extremely. Under I'm clipping that, and I'm not gonna make it sound right. <laughs> oh, please do, please put me on blast with it, that one. At least they put me on blast with that one and put me on TikTok. Not something about pro fish and not being professionals. If you got another job, Lord of mercy, semi-pro, um, semi-pro. semi-pro. That's what I am. I'm semi-professional. I'm full blown. But yeah, I know, dude. Chickens are awesome little animals because they are. They are pest control. They pro- they provide you with food. They're easy to take care of. Like, I never fed my chickens. Like, I only fed my chickens during the winter when there wasn't a ton for them to eat. But, like, now that it just started to warm back up, and they go kicking and a picking and doing all the little clucking and a, you know, whatever else they do out there. And, like, they just find food and eat bugs. I actually watched both of my chickens one day stand and they would look and they were watching this butterfly and they would jump and try to catch the butterfly out of midair. And I, mean, dude, I, was, I love chickens. I was like, dude, these chickens are just the bomb. Man, big old fluffy <laughs> so asses. They're just kind of da, 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 da. now they do get killed really easy. I mean, they don't have much of a brain on them. And so, you know, one bad thing happens and a hawk smokes them or a cat gets them. I mean, they their flight or fight instinct is more just kind of like lay down and die. Um, so I'm hoping that these six chickens that I got, that we can keep these six chickens for a good long time and they won't get smoked by any uh, predatory animals. You ever seen uh, the movie Moana? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That chicken is a very accurate <laughs> yeah, <for> that, description, yeah. <laughs> like yeah. trying to eat a rock. Like, yes. Yeah, that's a chicken. Yeah. Do you yeah. have Do you have a camera on like your your chicken kennel? I need to. I think I'm going to add one because I'm I'm wanting to see what's killing the chickens. I was going to say, do you could go viral with that? <laughs> <laughs> send it to send it to nature as metal and you can get your you get yourself put on there chickens getting murdered by house cats yeah. <laughs> yeah and then you could take that scene from uh you ever watch how i met your mother yes a little bit where it's like the murder like the, you know, <laughs> murder yeah <laughs> oh, that'd be it that's funny no yeah i would suggest anybody that's got a uh, got room for chickens get you some chickens they're fun there's a uh, there's nothing like the handling of a large or small cock. All right, underrated, overrated. This is going to be my favorite single one. We do got to get a Bobby in here. Bobby! Um, I love my dog. Anyway. That needs to be on the soundboard. <laughs> yes, it does. I need to add that. There you go. All right, underrated, overrated. And this is probably going to be my favorite topic of the night. Bigfoot. <laughs> underrated. He is underrated. Why is he underrated? Until proven real, he's underrated. Okay, so let's really talk about this for a second. Bye, man. Come here, buddy. What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, man. Look at this. Look at how pretty he is. He's that dog's just... got a better beard than me. Oh, look at him. He's just so pretty. He can't even stand it. Now, Bethany brought him back here, and he's not going to have hanging out with me. He's got to hang out with Bethany and not me. What's he got on his... Look at his little... Uh, he's got gremlins on... Oh, well, there you go. He's got gremlins on his uh, little bandana. Fancy pooch. Yeah, he's, he's fancy, fancy. All right, so um, let's really talk about this. Bigfoot. Dad Jim Bigfoot. So until we find him, all right, how, how do you think that it would be like earth-shattering news if we found Bigfoot? Like how, like what would that be like, do you think? Dude, that party. <laughs> <laughs> I start drinking at 10 a.m. As soon as I find out, he's like, I get up in the morning, first news report I see, Bigfoot real. I'm starting drinking. I, I'd tailgate it. I'd, whatever show, they'd have a spectacle if they did it, dude. I would tailgate the show. Like, I'd, I'd go all out. 
like his body's passing through the through the yeah. street. You're just out there, oh, yeah, he's real. I knew it. Yeah, no, I've always thought about that. I've thought about like the the moment that that they find Bigfoot or that we prove big. Well, okay, well let's back up a little bit. Let's back up. <laughs> oh my god. Let's back up. No, you, you got to read this comment first. It's okay, from right. it's it's from Hayes, and he said it'll be like the night they got Osama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boys, totally we got him. Yeah, I mean, it's like it's, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to. <laughs> well, first of all, can you imagine Joe Biden getting up there and trying to fumble through, uh, my fellow fellow Americans? Uh, we might uh, the oh. Sasquatches um, as a Bigfoot a um, to do by, yeah. But anyway, so yeah, no, it probably would be like the night that they got Osama. I mean, dude, like there'd be baseball stadiums full of people, and they'd be out there. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to announce to the uh, the public now that we have confirmed reports that we have found Bigfoot. Like, dude, and then the whole place just erupts. USA, USA. Yeah, no, I. That's In probably the current day, they would, they would just, ladies and gentlemen, is like. There's like Bigfoot standing behind him. He goes, we got him. <laughs> yeah, we got him. We got him. Dude, just standing in a cage like, yeah, you got my ass. Good job. I've been hide and seek champion for hundreds of years now, and you got my ass. Good job. <laughs> oh, no. But like, I, so so when you look at Bigfoot, Bigfoot is a real creature. Okay, we have we have fossilized proof of, a, of an animal called Gigantopithecus, which was a giant ape that lived in North America and in Asia. And, and so, you know, like... You're talking about a creature that really existed. And I think kind of going back to the whole Black Panther thing, I think we're also talking about a creature that actually existed in that it's just died off. And, you know, because, I mean, what did all of these Native Americans who never had any contact with each other have pay, cave paintings of these giant creatures that lived in the woods covered in hair? I think that they were experiencing a real animal in the Gigantopithecus and that those Gigantopithecus, as time passed on and as more people encroached upon where they live, eventually just died out, and I don't think they exist anymore. I don't think we're going to find them because I think we we forced them into non-existence. Now, that being said, I think if you are going to find anything like that anywhere, I think people sorely, sorely underestimate the size of the Pacific Northwest as well as, like, British Columbia. Like, dude, it is a virtual sea of green like there are places that like there are places that people have literally never set foot in british columbia before and so you can't tell me that there couldn't be something living there especially a real animal that at one time existed but may no longer exist anymore because of extinction so there you go so bigfoot was a real creature called a gigantopithecus I think it was a real creature that lived, it died, and it eventually died to the point that it never came back. All that being said, Bigfoot is extremely, extremely underrated, and I will continue to believe, and there's no taking away from me the fact that Bigfoot lived and may still be out there because, damn it, why can't there be a little bit of mystery left in the world? I, I think if if there's anybody out there that doesn't want to believe that the Bigfoot is real, you've lost your sense of adventure. I do, too. I believe in cryptids. I'm a big cryptid guy. I think there's a whole host of cryptids that are real and that are just, I dude. Okay. We're about to go down a rabbit hole. I can go down this rabbit hole. I mean, I've, we've talked about starting a show about this. Mm -hmm. I mean, like we really have, and I may, I may do it. I may start a show on cryptids and start talking about cryptids because I love it. I mean, I love just anything to do with that. It's like weird. Oh, there's a cat. This is my version of Bobby. What's its name? Uh, Rizzo. 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 <laughs> Rizzo. No, it just doesn't do as well as no, Bobby. No. You know. <laughs> no, he was he was adopted with that name. So Rizzo. What is Rizzo? What is a Rizzo? Like risotto? No, I have no idea. Okay, I, I got a rap. I got I got a little rap hole to go down here with this one. So we're on TikTok the other day, uh -huh. and there's this dog. I saw this dog named Potato. Okay. 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 Why the hell is it okay to name a dog potato, but not pizza or croissant or pretzel? Like, you, oh, this is my dog, Waffle. And people are like, oh, his name's Waffle. That's so cute. But if I walked up and said, this is my dog, Filet Mignon, people would be like, 
That's a little strange. <laughs> you ever thought about that? That's a great question. I and then you got people who name their dogs other animals. Like, this is Bear. This is my dog named Bear. Yeah, that's a famous dog named Bear. Okay, well, then why not, like, this is my dog, Giraffe? I guess people don't know that they want to. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think that's just human nature to not. Because, like, a bear, like, at least somewhat looks like a dog. And you, you people use the term bear as, like, something that's big, you know, or moose. They say that. They'll say, stop, like, a stop, moose. Stop, stop, stop. Do you hear that? I don't hear shit. My Google just like explained the road directions to somebody's house that nobody even asked it about. And I just hear Bethany going in there going, stop, Google, stop. No, don't do that. <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry. Go on. What were you saying? Uh, I'm trying to remember what I was talking about. Nah, I think I was just saying like there, there's certain like mammals that somewhat mimic a dog where like people say, yeah, my dog's a bear. Or like I would, I'd always call my lab. She's like, she was a big moose because... Moose are just gigantic and they're dumb. Where my lab, my lab was big and dumb. I uh, think I feel like there's certain things where like people use as like because it's somewhat similar. Whereas a giraffe is nothing similar than a dog. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, I kind of get that. I promise though, when one day Bobby passes, the next dog that I get, I will name it after some random animal. May it be an octopus, cockatoo. A cockatoo, a parrot, an ostrich. It's always been one of my favorite. Look at that dog named Cockatoo. What's his name? Cockatoo. <laughs> we call him Cock <laughs> or Cocky, either one <laughs> or a two. I don't know. Depends on what circles we're around. Steve Owens is here. Steve, you texted me earlier. Thanks for the texting. man. The man. Tell him he's coming on the podcast here soon. Um, do you? Uh, do you? That'd be a good one. I'll tune in for for for, for old Steve. Ask him, I want to ask him all kinds of tough questions like why plastic boats. <laughs> Do you name your chickens? No. Chicken one, two, three, four, five, and six. I can name my chickens, though. It's just hard to tell them apart. You know what I'm going to name them? You should totally make like an Instagram story series out of talking to your chickens every day. I mean, it'd probably be pretty good. I mean, I could talk to my turkey when he was uh, all about getting him some. I could literally just walk in there and go, hey, turkey. And he'd go, oh, dude. Sunday morning live shows with you. With your coffee, with your with your chickens in the background. <laughs> Morning talks with Macock. <laughs> Welcome to Morning Talks with Macocks. <laughs> Alex Rudd. There you go, dude. You're sold. You gotta love it. I love it. All right, bud. I think we did her in there, man. I think we pissed some people off with the coal shad, which that was, I mean, literally, that's the only reason I got on here tonight was to make people mad. Talk about coal shad and talk about things that don't exist. I think we did our job then. That's right. Dad said name the dog intestinal worms. What? <laughs> Come here, intestinal worms. Hey, listen, I got a cat named Tit. T-I-T. So, you know, what am I? I'm a pimp. Uh, I didn't I didn't believe that for a second when I came over to your place. So you're like, no, his, his name's Tit. Titty. You know? Yeah, Kitty the Titty. Or Titty the Kitty. That's her name. Old Tit. T I T T Y on her. I don't think it's on her official medical records. I told Bethany, I said, <laughs> be hilarious. Yeah, exactly. Southern Jersey fisherman, call trash. You got that right, buddy. That's what they're going to start calling me is call trash. So, all right, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and on and on that note, I want you to pick um, people in the audience, since apparently we don't have enough audience engagement or something like that. Um, blue, kind of green, purple, or pink. First thing that comes through is what I'm clicking. Blue, kind of blue, purple or pink. And uh, I'm going to click that one, and that's how we're going to end the show. And you got five? Oh, I got a pick? No, I'm letting the audience pick because we don't oh. have audience retention or audience engagement or whatever because it's a podcast. It's not a, oh, kind of blue. You will never forget the sacrifice that Sweet Baby Ray's made to save your own life and entrust in your hands the future of human civilization. What the <laughs> As always, you guys are sweet and a lot of blue. We will see you next week after this. Enough of this shit will make you invincible. Ooh, remember that. All right, we'll see.